advantage that TV series have over their movie cousins is that the actors in them age. Now while that may seem like a detriment, especially if the show is about immortals, it can actually work in favor of those that focus on character developing. We can watch a young genius in the field of medicine grow into a successful womanizing businessman, and watch an awkward young girl blossom into an awkward woman. While these kinds of transformations can be accomplished through makeup in film, it's so much more real when the audience too ages with the character, creating a feeling that the show's cast is part of a person's cohort group. Let's get some learning in. Cohort groups refer in broad terms to a subgroup an individual shares social connections with. They need not be related, but they all have similar social experiences, such as classmates, scout groups, or glee clubs. Very careful with that last one. It can get pretty hairy. The audience feels kinship not only with the characters on screen, but with each other, since all viewers have the same reference points to talk about when discussing the show. It's how days at work can devolve into Walking Dead discussion panels. Oh, those were good times. One day I dropped the bomb that I actually liked Lori. <laughs> Immediate chaos, so much blood. From Howdy Doody to Westworld, Philo T. Farnsworth's invention has shaped lives for almost 70 years, peaking in the late 1990s, where 98% of households had televisions that ran for averages of two and a half to five hours a day. That's a lot of friends. But when people weren't wondering, what's the deal with Melrose Place? They were tuning into something new, dark, and different. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. This out of nowhere exceptional series was an expansion of the premise from the 1992 movie of the same name. Creator Joss Whedon tried to distance it from that source material as much as possible, with only one reference in the pilot directly alluding to the film's events. Dad? You burned down the gym. I did, I really did, but, but you're not seeing the big picture here. I mean, that gym was full of vampire... asbestos. Seamless. Non-fans of it that only saw TV spots or bits of Cordelia in it, they thought this was just another high school drama with a weird twist. But this show loved going down the rabbit hole as often as possible. So why wait longer? Let's dive in and see how this blonde is one of the best awkward badasses of all time. Meet Buffy Summers, the newest student to transfer to Sunnydale High School. And the Sunnydale High School is full of bright young youths, and every day is a bright summer... <laughs> Sorry, forgot how sick excessive 90s cheese makes me. Ugh. It's not all meadows and beach parties, though. The pilot does give us a glimpse into Buffy's restless mind. And here's a weird thing about the first season. They shot all of it before any of the episodes aired, so everything you're seeing in this dream is basically spoilers for the rest of the first season. It's almost shocking that more modern shows don't do this, especially with Netflix's formula of create one whole season at a time. Then again, we are more sensitive to spoilers than we were back then. Speaking of, I will try my best to avoid major plot spoiling, but once we get to Angel, never mind, I'll throw a warning up when we get closer. Buffy turns heads when she goes to school, specifically the head of Xander, everyone's favorite Zeppo. He's your average unlikable teenage boy, with zero confidence and no clue that he's his own biggest obstacle in life. But he does share one thing with all the fans. He will support Buffy no matter what, because that's how 90% of high school crushes work. He works as a projection for the boys who watch this show, as he's bumbling, not suave, even kind of a jerk, but he means well. His heart's in the right place. So he's humanly flawed, but aiming for better, which is the best that most people can manage. Her other friend and constant sidekick is Willow, who makes Buffy's stumbling line to the principal seem like a soliloquy. Uh, hi. Willow, right? Why? I, I mean, hi. Uh, did you want me to move? It doesn't involve moving, but it does involve hanging out with me for a while. But aren't you hanging out with Cordelia? I can't do both. Not legally. Yeah, this season really focuses on the sharp divide between social classes in high school, almost to a stereotypical degree. But that's actually what makes it relatable. It displays a realistic way that high school drama can feel, where the politics of who you can and can't talk to are the rigid lines only true rebels like Buffy can break. She suffers for it with the popular crowd, but shatters the lines of where she should mingle very casually. And that takes a lot of guts. Of course, high school is not the scariest part of her day. By night, with the help of her watcher Giles, I should talk about Giles, shh, maybe later. She helps take down the forces that would conscript Sunnydale into the horde of bloodthirsty vampires that run its nights. 
No, really, that's the plot of the pilot episode. The vampires are going to kill off every teen in town in one night. I don't joke around. Sounds pretty heavy for a starter, but it does show that the season's villain named The Master is not screwing around. He helps set the tone for all big bads to come for the series, a truly credible threat in what would otherwise be a Monster of the Week affair. As he's such an integral part of what made Buffy the Vampire Slayer stand apart from its peers, let's bring in the DM to help explain why he's so important. You know, I'm starting to have my doubts that the DM is on sabbatical. Oh, sorry. Didn't see you there. Software got a few bugs in the interface. The what? Oh! Oh my god, I can see color again! You're a miracle worker! I try. That's what can I do for you? Oh, right. Um, tell me about the master from the first season of Buffy. Sophistication. <laughs> Class. And the long play. A villain's villain, really. A vampire twisted by age and corruption. The master has no name. <laughs> Isolated in a place forgotten by history. But he does have something vital to his success. <laughs> Patience. One could easily go mad waiting for the day to come to take back your freedom. Those long, dark years just staring at the unfinished space as it stares back at you and you smile back at it and you stare. And stare and smile. I can only imagine. Good thing some random vampires found him and gave him his means for escape. <laughs> Smiling and staring. So, any other thoughts? Yes, you lean on me too much. What? I'm beginning to see why the DM needed to take a break. I mean, you think that just because you're the host, you can just coast through these reviews, passing off your responsibility to the next person. I, I, I don't mean to do that. I just, I don't... Try to step all over anyone else's- And that's exactly what the master does to get inside his enemies' heads. Can you just say that next time? I could, but where's the fun in that? He has several plots and plans to free himself, all in motion, one right after the other. <laughs> he has no problem letting the Slayer know who's behind it, and he even lets the secret location get leaked so she can find him. And she plays right into his plan. He'd have gotten away with it too, if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. Thanks for helping, Storyteller. Anytime. Feel free to stop by the roleplay next week. Oh, I'll try to. <laughs> According to the attendance sheet, <laughs> you don't try very hard. So while the Master is all the sinister fun you can want from a TV baddie, the Hellmouth is actually the reason any of us saw Buffy in the first place. See, the television executives were not sold on the initial premise, as they thought the story had already played itself out for what they saw in the movie. It was only this idea of an evil relic, a portal to hell that draws supernatural to it like a magnet that convinced them Buffy was worth investing in. Without that cliched Monster of the Week lure, we wouldn't have one of the first series to basically demand dedicated viewership. All this said, and I've just touched upon the two-part pilot so far. So we're gonna not focus on the specific events, like a possessed dummy going for brains, or insects seeking virgins to eat. Let's focus on the group between the monsters. Often, the episode arcs involve very teenage problems, like feeling alone in a crowd, being frustrated by those blind to your affections, or how people can be malicious for the sake of being mean. Buffy and her friends live the struggles of teendom, as the early Miss Summers can best be described as overreaction with no communication. The writers put real characters into their monster-slaying chaos. That's what really gets to the audience, even in this arguably hokey first season. You get a glimpse at who Buffy was and how she manages her demons before the world changes. And as with most teenagers, this change comes in the form of love. Still sticking to first season only, but trust me, You've been warned. Angel, played by a baby-faced David Boreanaz, is the constant lurker, always a presence in Buffy's shadow when the situation is most dire. He helps her out, but doesn't explain his stake in anything. Just lingers and stares, and then creeps, just for good measure. Fun side note, David Boreanaz has been in recurring television roles every year for 20 years, including this one. Yeah! That's kind of mind-blowing. He went straight from Angel to Booth, so it's just been one long stretch. In fact, it's kind of funny. I can't even envision the man without imagining him talking to a strong female lead. That's a cool quirk. 
He eventually reveals his intentions to protect Buffy, and then proceeds to show how much he cares about her well-being in this dimly lit scene in her bedroom where, yep, yep, there we go, and then... What? Let's hear what's wrong. Yeah, he's a vampire. Before Edward Cullen ruined this dynamic, Angel and Buffy were the epitome of the taboo couple. That's actually a violation of one of the cardinal rules of slain. The slayer must walk her path alone. And yet, she pays about as much attention to this as she does her friend's advice against dating the vampire. But it's this involvement with the group and the trust she has in them that oftentimes helps save the day and subvert an otherwise perfect plan to get her. While the title of the show definitely sounds like a lone badass hunting demons in the night, the focus is often how she can only accomplish this through the support of her friends and loved ones. And despite having all the normal teenage problems, she can pull off amazing feats that save lives, or even a whole town. And that's why Buffy the Vampire Slayer started out strong and just gained more clout as it went. It showed this ridiculous premise in the most realistic way possible. For all the camp and 90s cheese, Buffy Summers and her friends made landmark television, where the monsters they fought only served as a device to tell their stories and make them grow closer. It treated the characters like real individuals, with better long-term memories than shows before it, which helped the audience relate to them. In a way, those that grew up watching Buffy were part of her group, watching both the good and bad times, and ultimately rewarded for getting to know her. The best part is, it gets better in the second season. For those of you who have never seen Buffy, it is definitely worth some binge watching. Great group dynamics, awesome individual development, and just wildly entertaining all around. I'm Socio, and one season was not enough. Where's the fun of that? <laughs> I don't know what the f that was. I don't either! <laughs>